digital revolution. And almost immediately, because I was familiar with digital platforms, got monitor mixing gigs right off the bat. I started with a guy named Clint Black. Uh, recently, uh, for the past eight years, I've been the monitor engineer for Blake Shelton from The Voice. Uh, I've also been, last year, mixing the 90s rock band better than Ezra some. Uh, with Blake, uh, it's a mixture of in-ears and wedges. Uh, Blake doesn't use in-ears at all, so he's on wedges, but the rest of the band is on in-ears. Fantastic. Thank you, Brad. And then... Last but not least, Andre. Hey, I'm Andre Williams from New York, born in the Caribbean. Um, I do monitors for ASAP Rocky, um, Summer Walker. Started off doing monitors for Patti LaBelle. That was definitely my first ever major gig in the industry. And I do both in-ears and wedges. That's a little bit about me. Thank you, mate. Okay, so we'll, because we're going to cater, we want to cater for kind of novices who might not know much about monitoring, monitor mixing, or in ears or anything like that. Um, we're just going to quickly give an overview of that and then we'll jump into a few questions and hopefully um, a little bit of education about how these superb guys that we've got here kind of go around doing it. So obviously, um, floor wedges, floor monitors, whatever you want to call them, are speakers on the stage, but essentially it's for the artist to be able to hear themselves and hear and monitor their performance on stage. Uh, obviously, in-ear monitors now, they wear the little in-ear monitors in their ears and they have a little pack on their body, which is a receiver. Um, these guys, obviously, through the mixing desk, um, make the mix, which goes to the transmitter, out to the artist and they can monitor uh, exactly what they're doing. So I guess um, taken from that, Tim, I think you've got the first question that you'd like to put to the panelists. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind and a, a question that always came to me when I was out mixing is w when you first encounter someone who's making their, their foray into the transition from wedges to going to in-ears and the difference of approach that they as a musician or a vocalist or an artist needs to take is different and it's also different for you as an engineer and I know part of that's communication but I'd really like to, to focus. I think we've lost him there but I think what he was going to say was he liked to kind of focus on how you guys would take an artist um, who's maybe new to in-ears and start building a mix from complete scratch. Um, so I, I'm going to jump to Andre, first of all, for that one. First, I will definitely have a sit down with the artist before even starting with the in-ears, explaining to them the difference between what the in-ears bring to the game that over the wedges, which is, I think you get a much more closer encounter when the music seems closer to you and you can hear everything at a, like, a, definitely in front of your face, say, instead of the wedges, sometimes you move away and you can't hear it because the wedges is not covering the whole stage or you don't, don't have enough wedges to cover the whole stage. So you're always going to be hearing the same thing constantly. So that will yeah. definitely be my first conversation with them. That's a, that's, that's a great answer. And let's just, just jump over to Brad. Have you got anything to add there, Brad? Well, if we're talking about a singer, which usually the main artist is a singer, I like to always just start getting their vocal sounding right. I don't even worry about what the band's going to sound like. So I'll get them to put their in-ears in and get the mic sounding the way they like to sound. It might want it to sound and then figure out where an acceptable loudness level is. I really encourage people to only listen as loud as they need to listen, but not any louder, because you can really mess things up if you just try to listen way too loud. You can bring up all the ambience and um, just make your ears tired. So I usually start there. Uh, we'll talk about if they wanna have a little bit of reverb or not. Um, and that's, that's usually where I'll start is getting their vocal to sound right and then build around that. 
yeah, that's I, a similar similar experience as well. London, have you got any different? Uh, yeah, I think I think what what we do and what makes us so different as modern engineers is building a trust and building that relational aspect of what we do. A lot of people are musicians and they've never communicated with frequencies or things, so they're intimidated to begin with. And I think building that trust and that that and developing a sense of communication in word in their own words um, can can make them as comfortable as they can be from the beginning. And then I agree with Brad, like getting their vocal to sound uh, as as natural as it can, um, because they're going to be they're not used to hearing their head voice being closed off and hearing that that um, thicker sound and and being sealed off. And even even little things like um, the the pressure in your middle ear when you're when you're hitting certain notes or certain uh, certain uh, instruments can feel bizarre at first. And if they don't have a, a vocabulary to communicate certain things to you, uh, it can it can make your job harder and it can make them frustrated. So I think I think that's a big thing of of explaining um, the kind of giving them a heads up as far as what to expect. When they when they put them in from the beginning, and then um, I'll, I'll, some things come with experience, like understanding how uh, certain levels or things can affect their own pitch reference. You know, if something's too quiet, they might sing flat, or if something's a little bit louder, you can hear them straining, trying to sing over that that volume that that they're trying to compensate for. So a little bit that comes with with uh, experience of knowing, like, and and over time, getting to know the artist you're working for. And, and knowing when they're comfortable, when they're not comfortable. And one of the huge advantages of in-ears is, is talking with them about placement left to right in a stereo image of where do you want the click track to be? Do you want it in center or do you want it off, off just barely, you know, just a little bit of a pan can make a huge difference as far as just panning a click just off of um, to get it away from that vocal or a guitar part. and. And just think about how you know, kind of communicate with them in a, in a in a left to right perspective of how they want to hear things, and uh, and it, it can make a huge difference as far as making things punch out or 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 making them uh, hear what they need to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I guess when, obviously one thing within ears as well, the way that productions are moving as well now is a lot of people are playing to a click track. So obviously being able to have the click that you don't want blaring through a wedge is kind of a huge advantage to that as well uh, with using in-ear monitoring. But uh, let's just jump to Alex and see uh, how he'd set up um, an initial mix for a new artist. So one of the things that I try and do when people have never used in-ears before, especially custom in-ears, is get them to wear them on the train or, you know, it's another point so they, they get used to them moving their jaw and moving their mouth around when they've got these lumps of plastic uh, filling their ear canals um, and as people have said their instrument needs to sound right to them if it doesn't sound right and be it their voice or the guitar or whatever um, it, you're gonna just start off on a bad foot and it's just going to be hard work so getting those fundamental things correct in the first place then you can worry about the rest of the band and their whatever kind of niceties that you might not think about when you're mixing wedges or um, people have done for them in the past in when they haven't had somebody that's going to make effort and pay attention to actually what they need. Um, as far as click tracks go, um, I think it's just like trying to get people not to listen to them at deafening levels so that they actually play as a band rather than it a various number of individual musicians just playing to separate click tracks. Um, obviously some musicians are worse at this than others, but certainly I find with drummers, you can they can happily make themselves go deaf over a very short amount of time by having a click track at unbearable levels. And if you don't control that, A, their playing doesn't get any better for it, and B, all they're doing is losing their hearing. Um, and to be fair, the same can be said for vocalists. We've all worked with vocalists that insist on having their voices at levels uh, that probably aren't very good for their hearing. Um, and it, it's about making that a sense, making sensible choices to keep them healthy and keep their hearing healthy, because nobody needs to be deafening people. 
and it can happen quite quickly over not a long time. Um, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> that's great. Thank you, Alex. And last but not least, let's jump to Chopper and uh, see how you'd approach this situation. Yeah, I mean, um, pretty much a blend of what everybody else has just said. I think fundamentally, um, volume on a pack as like a good starting volume is uh, is is a, is a quite a critical uh, conversation to have with an artist. Um, and then moving on from there, again, um, making sure their principal instrument, be it their voice, be it the drums, be it the guitar, um, make sure they're happy with it and to make try and make things sound as natural in their heads as you can possibly get. Um, quite often when an artist has only listened to wedges because of the physicalities of having to deal with feedback or room and all the rest of the stuff, um, they're probably not used to hearing their voice in, in such a clear and, uh, you know, sort of plain, isolated manner as they, as they get um, through an in-ear pack. And I think another thing to be really conscious of and to have a really good chat with an artist about is to, um, is to let us guys deal with the volumes and uh, not have the artist constantly reaching for their pack um, you know, to turn their voice up because they've just, you know, you're playing a particular song or some part of the song's kicked in, their voice may be a little bit quieter than they want, they crank their pack up, and then all of a sudden, you know, you kick into the middle eight or something and everyone's mm -hmm. eyes are rolling in the backs of their heads. Um, so it's just kind of sort of laying out the fundamentals, I think, explaining how things work, um, explaining, um, you know, a good route of communication between the engineer and, and the artists on stage. Um, again, once people are on in ears, you've got added functionality where, you know, as an engineer, I, you know, you can speak directly to the artist or anyone on stage straight into their ears. You can have a conversation. You can give them a little microphone on stage. We have a chat mic on stage for most of the artists um, in the Harry band. Um, a lot of it is because of the distances, you know, to stage and sight lines, but um, it gives everybody, um, clearer communication, there's that sort of winking and nodding and um, it just improves everybody's, um, I think, sense of ease when they're on stage, knowing that they can get what they want straight away. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you guys, that's that's brilliant. There's a couple of questions coming in. So from Angelos, he's asking, mono or stereo in ears? So I'm gonna let one of you jump in there, whoever wants to answer that one. <laughs> um, I'll take that if you want. Go on then. Um, I would say always stereo. Um, as, as we were just saying, um, having the ability to give stereo gives you another dimension to the mix. So um, as well as creating room within a mix via um, EQ or compression, you've also now, with the stereo mix, got the ability um, to spatially track things um, around in someone's head. Um, and <clears throat> because you're hearing things directly into your ears and you're not hearing things coming from the floor, or, or from you know a PA rig or a, a guitar rig or whatever, um, being able to move you know simple things like panning people's vocal mics around in relation to where people are stood on stage gives them also then a sense of direction and a, a, and a sense of physicality within a band as a whole rather than a person just stood in the middle of the stage with everything hammering down the center of their head. Yeah. That's great. We've got another question here. Um, Ashish, who's asking that he's, he's recently started working as a monitor engineer and he's facing uh, an issues with a mix of all the different musicians having different in-ear moulds. Um, so again, this isn't for branding or anything, but generally, um, is that something that you'd recommend that everyone has the same type of in-ears, be it generic or moulds, or the same, the same kind of brand, or is... Um, using different ones how, how would you overcome that that issue i think it definitely it. i think it definitely helps especially if you're not an experienced monitor mixer or also if the band you're mixing is not experienced and can't tell you what they like things to sound like i think it really helps to either be on the same model or at least like the same brand i find that certain brands of in-ear monitors have their own sound signature compared to other brands. But if you get more advanced, you can use output equalization to make 
different in-ear monitors sound the same or if uh, you have a person that wants a specific sound signature that is maybe different than what other people want. It's not the worst thing to be on uh, different in your monitors, but I think it helps to have everybody on the same flavor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's great, guys. Uh, Tim, did you have any questions you want to jump in with there? Uh, no, actually, you did jumped into what I was going to say. I mean, we have a ton of questions coming in uh, and that's awesome. So uh, we're going to try to get to as many of these as we can as we go through the discussion. Uh, we're going to keep an eye on them for everybody out there watching and, and try to put them into the right spots of where they, where they come in. So please know that we're seeing them. Um, the volume of questions, the quantity is, is great. So we'll, uh, we'll do our best to get as many of these in as we can. So thank you. So I'm going to jump back in with one of these questions, um, actually, and it's how do you deal with a vocalist who tends to use one ear in and one ear out? Um, has anyone got an, an experience of, of this situation? <laughs> I see Brad <laughs> waving his fist there. I know I have. <clears throat> um, but does someone want to jump on that one? Andre, oh. have you, do, do you... I'll, I'll... Oh, right. I'm I just, Brad. Brad's ready. Go I, on. I'm, I just, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna let somebody else field how they deal with it. I'm just gonna say, I give the artists what they want. If they're writing my check and that's what they want to do, I'll discourage it, but I'll do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Definitely. And Andre, I'll let you I'll chip in. There. Like, <clears throat> that's like a new common norm now. Everybody's taking one ear out. But if it's like a singer per se, I find out what their fundamentals or what what definitely do they want to hear, and that will be the uh, thing that I'm driving in that one ear that they have in, and everything else. Like I try to do a combination of sidefills and ears at least, so everything else I'll try to put in the sidefills per se. Yep. So they've at least got some. Yeah. Some monitoring there. Yeah, um any anyone else got a one one ear in one ear out artist because you do see it now it's quite common what do you think mm. that they're trying to achieve by that yeah i mean i think um i think one of the things you've got to do to figure out is why they feel that they need one ear in and one ear out um personally i i try and discourage it as strongly as possible um if for no other reason then you know you can end up um, if you have a loud volume on stage, um, you can end up driving the pack a lot harder for the one ear. Um, and you know, your, your body, no, no matter whether it's your ears or your hands or your legs or whatever, your body strives to be in balance all the time. So if you're on a loud stage and you've only got one ear in, um, you're going to instantly have to run that ear louder than you would if you had two in. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's not healthy for anybody. You know, I think fundamentally for, a, for a, a safety point of view, as far as, you know, monitoring levels go, um, you know, it's, it's a big, it's a big thing for me. I would, I would discourage it as strongly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, I had a, a I'm going to go back in time here, but I had a challenging artist one time who was doing the one ear thing. And the way I, I was able to get around it was to say, let's test some new mic capsules and just start with the mic only and let him go through some capsules and listen but put both ears in so he could he could hear what those capsules sounded like and then i brought the band on stage in the middle of it and then turned the band up under him and he never took his other ear out again because he already had some ambience going on and he didn't have too much going on in his mix to start with it was kind of like a trick but you know it's it's different people it's 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 hard to get around them sometimes but it worked in this case but I, I always noticed when the packs came back to me with one ear that they were twice as loud or, you know, three numbers louder than if they went out with two. Yeah. Okay. So that, that leads me to another question then. So if an artist is pulling one ear out, it's probably because they feel disconnected from the room maybe. Um, so encouraging them to put, wear two ears in, which obviously everyone agrees on, how can you make that feel more of a natural mix and put a bit of air into it maybe, or make them feel as, 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 as that they're part of the room, if you like? So I'll, I'll go to Alex for that one. I've found, it depends, because 
if you're working with a band that it's the music itself is quite loud there's not a lot of room there for say audience mics during the um during a song but what i have done occasionally is to insert a reverb with no no uh, pre delay maybe one second reverb tail over the whole mix just so that everything isn't sitting in front of them it is a little bit of depth to it so you're just giving it a little bit more room to move so it doesn't feel quite as um isolating and then when the song ends you can add audience mics in to get respond the response of the audience um rather than trying to fight putting audience mics in during a song where you're getting reflections back off the pa and you're getting reflections of everything else that's just going to make everything a little too muddy a little bit too mm -hmm. uh inaudible um in and different styles of music kind of lead to different things i know when i've worked with like straight up rock bands i one trick that worked really well was to stick a pair of uh condenser microphones kind of left and right of the stage generally making a kind of like stage overhead so you get everything in and feeding a little bit of that in essentially to do the same give the same effect of like inserting a reverb over it but kind of you'll hear a little bit more guitar on the right hand side because that's where the guitar cab is um that's worked quite well um but generally i try and avoid just leaving audience mics on all the time because I, I don't think it works very well but um saying that i might have done it wrong <laughs> Well, this is it. it. Sounds subjective, isn't it? There's a lot of people right. saying that on the questions now. So, I, yeah, mean, I don't think there is some right or wrong things. Sorry. Oh, I think there, um, just... I, I was going to add to that. I think <laughs> yeah, uh, a side effect of of inserting a whatever whatever platform you're on, inserting a reverb on on each individual band member um, to have a sense of consistency, like doing a fly date, going from an arena to a to a theater to a outdoor uh, amphitheater situation if you have that that similar sound they're used to that's kind of that that mm. comfortable bed they they're used to sitting in um, and then you introduce the room sound on top of that it can it can make your job easier of going from sound check of an empty room an arena whatever having that kind of baseline that they're used to and then adding ambience of either in song breaks in between for applause or whatever, um, that, that can really make your job more, uh, a lot easier going from different environments, you know, big, big arena stadiums to whatever, it just kind of, and especially if it's on board and it's the same every time you load your show file, no matter, no matter where you are in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Tim, did you want to jump in there? So, um... well, I actually did. It was, uh, I was just, commenting on how many questions we were having. We're, we're trying to keep up with those while the conversation's going here, so. Have you got a few uh, pulled we'll, out that you'd like to ask? No, actually, uh, when I sent you that, it was the ones you, you just jumped on, so we're good so far. Uh, okay, cool, so, that's good. Sorry about that. Um, so it's, uh, I guess one thing, um, that we could jump onto then is how, cause you, I know Alex mentioned it before and also it's, um, we're obviously mixing for the, the in-ears for the artist, but there's two engineers at the gig. So obviously you've got a guy out front there. So let's just talk a little about the, about the relationship between a front of house engineer, maybe where he would want a microphone and where for in-ears, maybe you would want a microphone and how you kind of work together to sort of achieve that, um, that balance where everyone's happy. Uh, I guess we'll go to Andre first for that one. I think for me, um, I work with two main front of house guys a lot, Brandon and Burton, right? And they always take my take on a lot of things, on my position of microphones. So I never really run into the issue bickering back and forth with a front of house guy, per se, because at the, I think at the least, one of the guys definitely is the one holding the show in their hands per se because if we if we mess up the artists mess up then they don't, the audience don't have a good show right yeah and we don't want who basically take care of the front of house guy like if there's a buzz if there's any 
issues on stage. We need to fix it before it even get to them. Yeah. So I'm always finding me working with front of house guys always take my take on a lot of things. That's cool. Um, London, do you have a similar experience or how do you work around it? I, I think the, I haven't run into mic placement suggestions as much as more as like um, the mic selection. And within reason, I think the, if, if, uh, sorry, it, it, the the last few tours I've been on traveling internationally has been been kind of at the forefront of like, what can I get in um, certain countries? Uh, but if if a front house guy has a, you know, we all like to experiment and tinker. So if they have their mind set on something specific, as long as it's not something that's going to adversely affect uh, bring in too much ambience or, or, or something that's going to affect a large percentage of, of what's coming from the stage. Um, I usually, I actually usually defer to the front of house guy uh, as far as what they, what they're looking for. And, and like that kind of, I think a lot of what we're, uh, no matter what we're talking about is understanding what they're trying to do out front and understand and have them understand how it affects you on stage. That seems to be the similar conversation that we always have of like, you know, I don't mind trying the new shiny thing if that's what you want to do but let's see what it's like in rehearsals and let's see how it affects me on stage and you out front. And if it's, if it's delivering the, the, the end game of what you wanted to try that for in the first place. Yeah. Chopper. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would kind of agree with that. Actually, I usually defer um, to front of house. Um, Mike placements. I'm, you know, I, again, I would usually let the front of house guy sort of have first pick. And then if something's uh, if something's not working for for us on stage or it's it's called a particular issue, uh, then we'd have a chat about it. Um, vocal capsules would normally be the one thing that I have uh, some sort of opinion on. Um, be it because uh, you know for us on stage the the caps is too wide and we're picking up too much too much stage noise or screaming girls or whatever it may be. And or obviously we hear the capsule really direct, directly in our ears, whereas you know they've got hundred or so <clears throat> feet of um, room between them and us. So so we we can hear some characteristics that they may not be hearing um, in a room or in a large PA, which may be you know we maybe we don't like or the artist doesn't like or they can hear themselves you know too breathy or too you know all that kind of stuff. So. Um, it's always it's always around a, you know it's a good chat. But I'm I'm in a similar position where I kind of work with the you know the same one or two front of house guys. So we've we've you know I've got a 15 year, 20 year working relationship with uh, with most of the people I work with. So it's never really an issue. Great. Right. And um, let's jump to Alex as well for that that one. Yeah, well, just to kind of go along with the same. same I've thing. always gone with the front of house guy kind of gets the first pick with as chopper said with the exception of vocal mics um I, there's been very few occasions i can think of certainly in recent times where i've had to do anything drastic um the only time i can think of is when an artist specifically asked for something to be done that was purely for them um and so I just added another microphone to deal with that thing that was just for them and they didn't need it to go out front of house. So generally it's been pretty much just go with what the front of house guy has gone. Unless, yeah. as I said, it's been, that would be detrimental to what I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Thanks, I've worked with good people, so I've not needed to question what they wanted. That's good. And Brad, similar situation for you? The front of house guy for Blake, uh, he tells me, uh, I love the guy. He says, y'all just get it to sound good on stage and I'll make it sound good out here. <laughs> so uh, he gives me pretty free reign with mics and placement. And I try to work with the band members and we'll start with their equalizers flat and try to get the mics where they sound best flat and then we'll season them to taste. Um the only thing that Blake's front of house guy is a little particular about is the vocal capsules. And that's because we always have a long runway that goes out in front of the PA. So he needs something that works good in front of the PA. So that's not always 
the best sounding microphone for what I'm trying to do on stage, but it has to work for him out front. Yeah, that's great. We're going to, as, as part of this series, we're actually going to do some front of house um, seminars as well. So I'll ask the same question from the other end of the mullet car and see how, uh, see how those answers differ as well. I but thanks, people... guys. That's really useful. I'm going to hand to Tim now. Sorry. Brad, we should get paid to do the front of house one. That'd be fun. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so I, I've got a couple of really good questions uh, coming in. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm going to try to put these not in order of the way they came in, but to try to cover some of the people who maybe do this on a different level. Uh, and this is an interesting one, and it's about I'm a guy at a local venue, and the bands are coming in with in-ears. But being the local guy, they don't have an extra transmitter and pack for me. So to put their mixes together, I'm having to use my Q wedge. Is there any advice you guys can give to, okay, I don't have any ears. I don't have a transmitter, but I need to service these guys because it's a service gig. But I'm going to use a Q wedge to build their mix. Tough question. Yeah, uh, I think, oh, go ahead, Brad. Oh, I would say get some the cheapest in-ears that you can afford that are good and plug in the headphone jack on the console. I still do it all the time. If I'm on a fly date and they don't only have enough transmitters for the band and not for me, I'll plug in the headphone jack all the time. Okay. That's a good one. Anybody else? I was just going to throw in, um, if, if, if you're in a situation like that and you're not very comfortable with, with driving, uh, in ears, just be very aware of safety and how quickly things can get away from you. Like just small adjustments, especially mm -hmm. for used to, to wedges and, and hearing something on a Q wedge. And, and if you're not uh, using a pair of in ears on, on the on the headphone jack, um, you know the smallest change can be a lot bigger change to them than it is in in the Q wedge. And just be very careful of 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 you know drive very, very slowly when it comes to things like that. Okay. Anyone else have a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say exactly the same thing. Um, you know, making a transition from, from wedges to in-ears, the, the first thing you'll notice is the tiniest lot of movement on a fader or a pop. Um, you can hear instantly. Uh, and if that's gained to a mix, um, you know, you're talking millimeters or fractions of millimeters on a, on a fader move, whereas it may be one or two millimeters, uh, you know, before you even hear it in a wedge. Um, so definitely, um, even if you can't afford a set of in-ears, like I, I would still say just plug a pair of headphones in, plug a pair of cans straight into the headphone output on the desk. You're going to be closer than you're ever going to be trying to hear anything uh, through a speaker. And I think if you don't have a pair of cans or some in-ears, I think putting the wedge at a shoulder height would definitely help improve a whole lot of what you're hearing than the wedge being on the floor trying to get to you. Maybe even managing expectations a little bit on their end of like, hey, you know, I, I'll, I'll do this. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. But, you know, this is what I'm this is what I'm dealing with. And I'm not, you know, may, maybe not admit that you're not comfortable doing it, but. Um, just, just kind of manage expectations going into that situation that, that, that you're kind of limited by time and other things to get them, you know, just managing expectations is a big part of that situation. I, I, I was doing that locally here in Nashville at a, at a small venue and um, kind of had to do that from the beginning. All right. Which uh, managing expectations is a large portion of the monitor gig, right? Um, okay, let's see. The next one is, uh, it, it's come up. You guys have been talking about one ear, one ear in, one ear out, uh, wedges, in-ears. Uh, this is a popular one. I've got about seven questions here on this one. How do you manage phase relationship between wedges and the in-ears? And then kind of in the same uh, ballpark is, I've got a drummer with an 18-inch sub and he says he can never hear the low end in his ears. Uh, is this coming from the sub? So, you know, basically, how do you deal with having live speakers and in-ears at the same time? And uh, I'll take whomever would like to go first. 
Go on, then. I'll jump in. Um, there's two answers to that. One, um, if you can't hear the high end, uh, the low end, sorry, in your ears, um, it, it could be down to um, the particular set of veneers that you're using and or the fit. Um, if you're using custom veneers, um, the seal in your ear is massively important to, 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 towards generating uh, a low end. Um, as far as speakers and spas, subs go with drummers, um, if you've got the choice, try and uh, maybe try and use a 15 inch or something. Um, not hearing a sub behind you can be, can be as simple as uh, the wavelength. Um, so the sub's too close, the sub's too far away. Uh, it could be out of phase, but it, it, you, know, I, you would still feel the sub if, um, if the phase was slightly out of time with your ears, I would have said. Okay. Uh, anyone else have a mix of, of wedges, subs on stage at the same time? I like to try to uh, only have the low end coming from one source. So if you're trying to get all the low end out of the sub, you can take it out of the in-ears for those channels or overall, because uh, that, that'll eliminate the possibility for cancellation if it's only coming from one place. So you're using like a... A, a high pass right uh, on the on on the channel or on the send right okay A anyone else that's a great idea i think some of that might be uh like a lot of things you can overthink things uh because you have so many channels coming from the stage and so many reflections going on it's it, uh where do you start you've got you've got uh, either wedges or side fills, or you've got reflections from the PA coming back from seats or the arena. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not discounting that you want it the best you can, but you're kind of fighting your own battle there of, of what your biggest gains are going to be. And, and that's, that's kind of where experimenting can come through. Like I've had good, good experience with um, the, 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 the balanced armatures in these ears are so small that they're fighting an uphill battle to begin with, reproducing some of these frequencies, sub, uh, you know, sub 50, 60 hertz. And I've had really dramatic results, uh, high passing things, uh, electronic inputs, tracks, keyboards, things that don't need uh, to have those in your ear. You can have dramatic results cleaning up, cleaning up that, that, uh, that reproduction in your ear and, and making more space for other frequencies, especially if they have a sub behind them, you can you can take it out of their ears and and favor that that mo air movement they're looking for anyways. They're not going to get that in their head, um, and and you can really give yourself more uh, more dynamic range for other things when you push it off onto a sub rather than fighting an uphill battle with a balanced armature that can't reproduce that anyways. Very good. That's, that's a good one. Sorry. Any, any questions? Any any Thing to add there, or? just jumping back to the questions. Then we have ninety nine questions. So sorry, guys, we're not going to get to all of them. Um, but I, I've lost it now. But I did see one that was basically: Do you find that you can be more aggressive with EQ in in ears than you can with monitors? Obviously, because for the lack of feedback, I guess this is aimed at. So I'm going to jump to. Andre, do you want to take that one? Definitely. Um, I think with in-ears, you could actually, what we call sweeten, like high-end and low-end stuff. You could actually sweeten stuff a little bit more than what you could do in wedges, per se, before you get to the point of feedback. And add air, add more air to like a vocal mic and stuff like that than what you could add to a wedges. So I definitely pick the in air that you could definitely go more aggressive on EQ than what you could do on a wedge. Yeah, does everyone agree with that? Or has anyone got any? Yeah, generally consensus the same. You could do a lot more with EQ through the wedges, uh, through the in ears, sorry, <laughs> on the edges, just checking. Uh, sorry, Tim, did you want to jump back onto something? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a conversation, so whomever's got the good one, uh, I do want to make a big shout out. I've, I've been looking at the people attending here, and big shout out to all the people.
people from soundgirls.org that have joined us. Uh, if you have any questions, send us our way. Um, here's one that's, uh, to me, I guess it's a little bit, it's not as uh, prevalent as it once was with digital desk, but uh, I think it still is important. Pre or post fade for mixing monitors? Ooh. I'll just go around the around the block on this. <laughs> um, I uh, I'll take a little bit of this. Um, I tend to do a little bit of both, mm -hmm. um, depending on how uh, how you want to set your board out. Um, how you want to have, if you want to have access to things quickly. Um, obviously on a digital console now, you can pretty much assign um, any fader to be anything you want. So if you want to run um, a lead vocal uh, into a VCA and always have that at your fingertips, um, then you would, you know, stick that into pre-fade. Um, so you can, you can grab it without affecting anyone else's mix. Um, but I mean, most channels on, on one of my mixes, most channels would be uh, would be would be post fade um, with you know the odd exception which wouldn't usually be because I'm trying to do something um, on a VCA or if there's uh, a particular reason maybe um, for something like a reverb send or anything like that um, where you don't want to be be altering the the volume uh, levels to uh, reverbs if you want them consistent. Okay, uh, Alex. Yeah, on my current gig, I, for various reasons, have decided to send all my artists' faders post fade to groups so that I've just got all of my all of my bits in front of me in a small place, um, really, so that I don't have to flick through a load of banks. Um, but obviously, that means that all of the rest of the band have got to be pre fade so that I'm not uh, altering their mixes. Um, so it depends on what I'm doing and how I want it to behave as to how I'll have it pre or post. Um, like Job said, reverb sends and bits and pieces that you don't want to change the send level to. Uh, you can do different things to make it work for you. But obviously thinking about all of the mixes you're doing rather than just in a generalization. Okay, uh, Andre? I'm definitely a post fade guy, but I do do pre fade on some like somebody who don't needs a whole lot. If there's like a guitar player or keyboardist who don't needs a whole lot and a whole lot of attention, I definitely do pre fade and post fade for everybody else, especially the main act or singer whoever that may be help me control it makes a whole lot easier okay uh, let's see line uh, i think i think understand like that like we're all kind of dancing around the same explanation is i think understanding the the pros and cons of of certain channels and the 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 benefits of doing that like i think channels that you absolutely should be post fader like guest vocal channels things that can come out at a level you don't expect maybe a, a you know a dj input or something on a, on a local level the, at a festival situation things that things that can surprise you that you need to grab quickly and affect everybody on the on on stage mm -hmm. at the same time that can be super helpful especially when you're trying to do things quickly um I actually on this last tour, this isn't really pre, pre post fader thing, but I was experimenting with duplicating channels and having uh, the primary musician having their channel uh, compressed and, or sorry, having their channel not affected for their mix and then having a duplicate channel that was either uh, slightly compressed to limit the dynamic range of, of that instrument so that their primary instrument sticks out in their mix but the the duplicated channel that everybody else gets is limited in dynamic range a little bit and um or sent to a group like drums and then like that kind of just evening out those little transients so that their primary instrument sticks out compared to everything else that you're sending and, and it gave me really good results i had a lot of fun with that um but yeah i, I would say as far as quick quickness and readiness on on things 
just think through what you need to grab quickly to, to affect everybody on stage for either safety or, or just surprised. Oh, you know, I need to, I need to fix that quickly. Uh, understanding the, the pros and cons of that. That makes sense. How about you, Brad? Landon pretty much touched on the, my philosophy on it too. Um, on tour, I tend to run the band on pre-fader and then I'll run the artist either post-fader or on the main fader mix so I can use VCAs. On festival kind of stuff, I lean more toward all post-fader to have VCA set up. So I have an all vocal VCA, I have an all instrument VCA. So that way I can make changes quickly on the fly. If I'm hearing feedback, I can just turn all the vocals down a little bit in all the mixes and that can clean things up quickly. Uh, I also will do a kind of hybrid thing where, let's say I have three people who want me to ride the guitar solo for them. Well, then I'll set that to post fader so I can ride the guitar solo on a VCA for everybody. It's mostly for me all about being able to use VCAs. I don't really go to the main fader to make the changes, but I'll do a lot of stuff with VCAs. Okay, yeah. So it's uh, the general consensus is problem channels and things that can can give you some headaches you put post fade in a lot, in a lot of cases okay uh, brad i'm going to stick with you on this one because i know you have wedges specifically on your principle and this is going away from ims for a second what's the correct way for eqing wedges to reduce feedback do you do the wedge send or are you doing the vocal channel uh, I do a little bit of both, and I also, because I'm on a, a big digital console, I can use another workflow too, but for small things, I'll try and get the big feedback out on the channel, because we don't want to EQ the wedge so much that we take all the frequencies out for the instruments too. Uh, so what I'll start by doing is getting the wedge to sound right with music. I'll just play something off my phone, just like I'm if you were doing a PA, I'll make the wedge sound good for music. And then I'll try to get as much out on the channel EQ of the vocals first. And then if I have to take more out of the wedge overall for the room or for more feedback, and it depends on expectations of how loud people want it to be too. Uh, but I try to not take it all out of the wedge unless I'm just trying to get it done fast and I'll just grab the graphic EQ if I'm trying to go real fast. Um, on my show for Blake, I have the band for him on the main left and right, and then I run his vocal and all of the guest vocals I go to the wedge on one group. So that way I can EQ the group, which affects all the vocals going to the wedges. So I don't have to ring out every vocal mic because I use the same capsule for all the guest vocals. So it makes it quick and easy for me to get to where I'm going. And, and I will ring it out and get all the feedback out that I can, because especially with those guest vocals, I don't know what people are going to do in the wedges. And then, uh, and then I sum it all together in a uh, in a matrix. So I'll take the group back into the matrix with the band mix for Blake. And that way, I keep the band nice and flat, and I can do a little group compression and even. And they're not going through a wedge that's completely EQ'd to death. Makes a lot of sense. Anyone else comment on that one? For Summer Walker, I do a little bit of the same thing that, but instead of music, I use pink noise to say, and she don't use in ears at all. So I use pink noise per wedge, per venue, and just take what the ambience of the room is giving me and clean the wedge up first. I never really change her mic EQ per se because that's the way that she likes it sound, the sound of the microphone tone. So I always try to reconfirm the wedge to make it sit at a loud enough level that it doesn't feedback without even changing her microphone EQ or gain. Very good. I think there's there's um, small things you can do. Like if you're if you're grabbing a bunch of uh, 31 bands in the same area or all high end, 
uh, there, it could be a quick change of just turning that that high amp channel down a little, a couple clicks, and then giving yourself those frequencies back in. Especially if you have two wedges butted up that are that are summing in a certain way that that's that's acting funny. Or uh, I, I think I do that with a lot of things. Like when you start making changes a bunch, all in the same frequency range or all in this all in the same channel, you start asking your quest, same. You start asking yourself, Am I doing something that's causing this, or am I fix am I fixing this the wrong way? Right. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, uh, let's see. I've got a, a quite interesting question and I'm gonna try to get it right here. Uh, this is from one of our guests, Simon Lord. Uh, so if I mess this up, uh, send us some messages. We're trying to read a bunch of things as we go, but this is coming from a different aspect. It's uh, This is from a broadcast perspective. It's a sound engineer that's trying to uh, service the guest performers while also giving them their uh, the talk back from multiple sources and program sound on a TV show. And he's looking for a, a good way to separate some of these sources from what the talent performance is. And he doesn't have the option to do it with stereo panning. So basically uh, what I'm imagining here is that you've got a, a talent on a TV show They've got the uh, stage managers and the directors and program sound coming in, and they're trying to figure out the best way to to separate those sources, keep them where they're intelligible, but uh, don't mess with the rest of the mix. Any, any ideas on that one? Are we are we talking about talkback, uh, like like chatter that's going on in your head, or are we talking it is, about yeah okay. talkback from multiple sources and program sound? Uh, I I think it they, comes they down. I know on the on this last arena tour I did I had I had um, a tour radio tied into my console. I have multiple talkbacks on stage. I had a uh, wireless comm with the stage manager. I had a bunch of stuff going on. I I um I think that's where panning is your friend, and also uh, understanding ways that you can matrix things into your solo bus. I mean, for a monitor guy, I'm not sure about a broadcast perspective, but when you, when you can matrix things on top of your solo bus and have the ability to turn those on and off, if it's distracting or not, um, there's a, you know, I have a kill switch and a macro that, that uh, if, if I'm having trouble doing my job, I can kill that and tell, uh, you know, if uh, in my situation I have a tech that, hey, can you punch into to the, to the mix and tell me if anybody needs anything, that way I'm still able to do my job. But if not, um, I, would, I would explore panning things hard left, hard right, in, in, a, in a predictable manner that you know, okay, far, hard right is my stage manager. If he needs me, he's over here. And if this is over here, that's, you know, so, you understand who's talking to you. I, I run into that with my band guys on stage. I have them panned in a certain way that I know who's reaching out to me um, if, if I'm distracted. Uh, predictability and consistency is, is the name of the game in that situation for, for me anyways. Great. Any other comments there? Um, I'll, I'll, throw a, I'll throw a little quick one in. Because um, I, I think part of the question was that it was in mono right and they weren't able to do yeah it was in mono yes. panning, panning would be your friend um in that situation um another thing that you can do um uh going back to what was just said about matrixing uh back onto buses or onto mixes um something we're doing on the current tour um with um chat mics so i've got the entire band they've got chat mics then we've got all the text dot around the arena or whatever uh, stage managers and various people. Um, sometimes it's really difficult to to get any sort of intelligibility out of what's coming into your head while you've got you know music playing and the bands in full in in full flow. Um, so we uh, we set ourselves up a little macro on the desk um, that ducks uh, the PFL bus. So uh, you set the threshold on a ducker. So when uh, so when the chat channel comes in. It triggers it triggers the threshold, and then that ducks your mix that you're listening to. So it ducks your PFL bus, 
by uh, a certain percentage that lets you hear um, the chat that's coming in. And then when that finishes, obviously you drop back below the threshold and your mix comes back. Um, if you get the threshold wrong, it's a little annoying and very distracting, but works really well uh, once you get it all sort of dialed in. That's a great idea. Absolutely. On, on some consoles too, you can, uh, you can make the master fader your solo level. And so any talkbacks that are matrix on top of that solo level, if you grab your matrix, I'm sorry, if you grab your master fader down, you're still hearing your talkbacks that are matrix on top of that, but your send from your solo bus is all the way down. So if you're having a conversation with somebody and you need to, and you're having trouble hearing over the music, you can yank that master fader down, I'm sorry, the master fader, which is your solo bus level down, and you're still hearing whatever's, what, whatever's matrix on top of that. that. That's been super helpful for me. Very nice. Andy, I know you've been looking at questions. Uh, we're passing this back and forth, so I'm going to give it back to you. It is. Thank you, guys. Uh, there's been, I mean, 128 questions. Uh, I've tried to sum them up and pull them together. There's a lot of people asking about theatre. Uh, just so you know, we are doing a theatre masterclass in a few weeks, so look out for that one. So I'm going to leave all the theatre questions for now. Um, but just to jump away from, from the tech for a little bit, uh, someone is asking... For those of you who've done front of house or monitors or different roles, why monitors? What's what 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 what's why have you decided to specialize in monitors? What is it that floats your boat about monitors? And whoever wants to go first. Or I'll pick someone. Chopper, you're smiling. <laughs> go on, yeah, I'll go. Um, I've done a little bit of both. Um I'm I'm I mean you know, I'm ninety-nine percent a monitor guy uh these days for sure. Um, I think you just find your, I think, I think you find your niche. Um, I'm very good technically. I'm not really a musician. I mean, I understand music. I understand, uh, the te technicalities of music. So for me, uh, to approach, uh, audio mixing, it's more of, um, a technical approach as it is to trying to recreate, um, you know, the album sound for everyone to listen to. Um, so that's kind of one, one aspect to it. And then, you know, you've got a whole different vibe when you're down on the stage with a band, you know, if you've got a really great band, you've got a whole, you know, you've got a whole vibe going down during the, during the gig, you and you, the interactions between you and the artists and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just think it's a lot more fun down the side of the stage. There's, there's, there's considerable pressure to go with it sometimes, but, um, it can be a lot of fun if you're with the right eyes. Yeah, I agree. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? From uh, my, go on, Andre. From my angle, I look at it as it's easier for me to please 10 people than please 25,000. So <laughs> I would definitely take pleasing 10 people <laughs> over 25,000. And the manager as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Alex? I was going to say, the, uh, I find the, the issues you have at front of house, that you, well, you can have at front of house, um, are just not as enjoyable to fix. You know, you're standing in front of house at a festival and all of a sudden all your HF let go is because of the wind. It's like stuff like that just defeats me and I, I don't want to deal with those kind of issues. And it's just more, I find it more fun to be on stage. Um, I don't like the bits that you'd have to deal with at front of house. Uh, and as you say, various people's opinions that you can't really change. Whereas your one-to-one -one individual conversations with the artists you work with, there you can do something about that because you have individual control over what you're doing with that one person. Whereas you don't with the audience or managers or whoever else may have want to give them, give you your opinion. Um, That's a great answer. Anyone else, Brad or Landon? Yeah, uh, I'll say that I'm a reluctant front house engineer. I Feel like with in-ear monitors especially and wedges too i can always get it to sound like it sounds like in my head whereas what i'm doing in front of house especially when room acoustics come into play bad room acoustics come into play i a lot of times when i'm doing in front of house i can't ever get it to sound like i want it to sound and i also fight with myself over loudness like i'll look at my spl meter I, whenever i do in front of house i'll have an spl meter i'll look down i'm like whoa 105 well how did that happen and uh, so I always feel like I'm just fighting with myself when I'm doing front of house. And I just like the instantaneous nature of doing in-ears. Like you make a change and it happens and it's there and 
it's for me more predictable. Right, London. Any, anything to add to I, that? I I enjoy the the psychological side of of really getting into somebody's head and understanding uh, just simple things like body language of that guy is going to look like you can tell when a problem is going to happen before it even happens because, mm -hmm. Oh, that guy is standing differently. And he's look like he, he doesn't even know he has a problem yet, but he's not, he doesn't look comfortable. And, and after either, either through over time relationships of under, of, of getting to know that person or, um, uh, like that taking, making 10 people unhappy, uh, sorry, making 10 people happy on stage is, is a completely different challenge than, and has its own set of politics than, than being out front and having somebody tell you how it should sound. Uh, I, I, I don't necessarily have any uh, ego when it comes to what I'm sending that person as long as they're happy and, and as long as they're not making bad decisions that's gonna affect not only what they can hear, but what I'm sending them. Um, and, and if it is, then, then we can have a conversation about it. That, that it, it's such a different service industry, uh, when it's one-on-one -on -one conversation about how can I help you hear what you need to hear to perform at your highest level. Uh, it, it's so gratifying when, when you build that trust and that, that, that relationship with somebody, whether it's an artist or a band member. That's great. So let's keep, let's keep with that theme then. So let's talk about the artists and how you deal with those. So is it essential to always be available to the artist at the whole time? Or do some of you have to monitor via watching a screen because it's in an arena and you're watching the, the broadcast feed? Or let's talk a little bit about how you, how you deal and try and make yourself available for the artist and, 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 um, and deal with that situation. So let's go. Do you want to go, Andre? I think with me, um, if it's not a direct path, that they can't see me. I always try to keep talkbacks available f for them to use to get to me. And like, there was a tour that I did where I was literally under the stage. And there was always a shot from a camera shot that a guy was in the pit on a camera shot. So I always told the artist, if ever you need me and you don't wanna go to the talkback mic, just, we had different signals for different things. So he would always just signal in that shot. And that was a shot on my screen constantly. Great. And anyone else? How, how would you make yourself available for the artist the best, best you can? Um, I'll jump in if you like. Uh, I mean, I've done, I've done both. Um, I'm a big believer in having uh, the best outline you can get to an artist. Um, I mean, you can do it via a TV screen. I've, I, I've, I've mixed shows where I've had a, an array of screens. Um, I think the problem with uh, having screens as averse to a direct line of sight is that um, you can miss a lot of the subtle signs, uh, like Landon was saying earlier on. Um, you know, once you've worked with an artist for a while, you, you can sense uh, when uh, something's wrong or when they need something. And you can sort of, you, you can get to the point where you can preempt, um, you know, you know what their mix usually sounds like, you can read the body language, you can have fixed, um, you can, you know, you, you, can have, you, can have made the, you can have made the adjustment before they've even had time to turn around and communicate to you. And I think that, um, that in itself is a really valuable thing. I'm just being able to learn and, and, and read people's body language. So I'm, I'm, I would, I'm a big believer in direct line of sight, for sure wherever possible, not always possible, but. Does anyone want to add to that? Or can I add a little bit into that of, of talking about signals? Do you, I, do I think you... there are situations that you get thrown into, whether it's a TV show or, uh, you know, a, a festival like Coachella or whatever, where you're behind a video wall. Maybe, maybe it's not even a, a set design for an arena that's, a, that's affecting you. It's the situation you're in. Um, developing small, uh, Body, not body language, small hand signals, real subtle stuff like, uh, you know, like putting your hand on your chest and then, and then you're pointing certain things. You don't even need to point up or down. If you point at the guitar, I know you need more of it. Little things like that, that in a situation that you can't control, like a, like a Saturday Night Live or a, some kind of situation that you're not even the engineer in charge, you're somebody that's a liaison, um, you, can, you can 
point you can pick out those things out very quickly and it's a it's kind of a dialogue that y'all develop over time of of making again making them as comfortable as they can be in a situation that maybe both of you are, are out of uh, out of your own control yeah alex <clears throat> just to add to what chopper said um i find myself with no sight lines regularly um, which is not ideal, but I try and get a specific camera sent to me, which is a wide shot, basically from where stage left would be. So I can try and add a bit more of what I normally would be seeing so that the artist can still do those little, um, little hand movements or whatever that we normally would do if I could see each other, knowing that I can still see her. And that's what I look at, um, if at all possible. Uh, but ideally, yeah, you just need to be able to see them because it just makes life easier. Yeah. Brad, anything to add to that? Oh, I've worked for a variety of artists. I've worked for artists who insist that I'm within sight lines because we have a whole playbook of hand signals, not just level changes, but EQ changes, reverb changes. Um, but Can you recently, give us an example? Oh yeah, I, I mean, just all kinds of, this means more mid-range, this means more highs. I mean, pretty crazy stuff that we had going on with him and he insisted I was with Insight Lines. He wouldn't do a show if he couldn't see me. Um, but more recently, uh, Blake is very trusting. He trusts me to do whatever he needs to do. So he doesn't care if he can't see me at all. Uh, if he needs something, it won't be major. He can whisper it to his tech and then his tech can tell me what he needs uh and then the band is all on talkback mics so they can communicate with me that way if they can't see me that's great so that leads us to another question is uh, that came in quite a while ago sorry but there is um someone is asking about once the mix is set for the artist do you generally tinker with it or do what you think is right or do you kind of set it and wait for the artist to uh, to ask I know, and then there was also, a, a, as a bolt onto that question, is um, is anyone using scenes or snapshots or whatever brand of console you use? <laughs> oh, so I can I'm jump gonna, back in, I can jump on, back in yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'll start with scenes. Uh, I have a scene for every song that he's ever done. So I have over 100, a scene for every song he's ever done. So I have over 100 scenes that I could pull up uh the scenes do so many things that i don't know what happens i hit the band hit the next button and the band is happy uh i don't really know and i know if i don't hit the button they're not happy so uh i find it to be helpful if you are touring with a band to be able to do that but it depends i mean if it's a real simple arrangement with a four-piece rock band you might not need it um and then what was the other question uh, so would you change anything on the fly if you, so would you wait for the artist to lead and ask oh. for the change or would you perhaps think actually they could do with a bit more guitar here uh right well um i would say that again it depends some artists say set it and leave it um and that's how blake was when i first started with him but that's not how i am i have to be making changes so i i'll ride guitar solos for him I also like to make the mix where uh, I have the rhythm and then maybe one pitch reference um, at a time. Like if there's three guitars playing power chords, I'll try to just give him one uh, because in wedges, it can really get loud and messy if you have too much going on. So I, I, I do tend to bring things in and out for him. Uh, if I didn't, would he notice or care? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but it keeps me busy and it keeps me focused on the music and listening for problems. Um, it would get real boring if I was just sitting there, I think. Yeah. Chopper, I saw you smiling away there. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way as Brad. Um, I have a scene for every song, like the, uh, the Duran Duran show file. I don't know, it's hundreds of scenes like crazy amounts and again um when you've got that many scenes and you've got that many people on stage and that many inputs that there's, there's no way to track what's in a scene um you know you lose all knowledge of of, of, of what's going on you know when you used to mix on on an analog console back in the old days you your brain took a map of that console 
And, you know, I could walk up to an analog desk at a festival and dial it pretty much from memory. I would have a cheat sheet, but like, you know, you, you would make those, those adjustments. But when you've got so much, so much stuff going on now on a digital desk, there's no, there's no way to keep up. You just, you can't. There's layers and layers and layers of stuff. It's bad enough trying to figure, remember what um, layer everything's on, never mind what, what you did for each individual person in each song. Um, as, as far as um, making adjustments go, um, I think that goes back to a little bit back to my previous answer where I think um, for my artists, I would say like 85% of the stuff is just once, once it's set and we're, and we're gurging you, you know, a week or 10 days into a tour, um, most things don't get changed. The things that I am changing are, um, you know, if something pops into your head and you're like, oh, that, that sounds weird in this song or that, that sounds wrong or that sounds broken, um, then, you know, you, you would go and have a look at that and maybe change it. And or then, you know, reading an artist's uh, body language again, um, you know, if, if someone looks unsettled, then, you know, you need to have a look at what's going on in their mix and have a listen and then make an adjustment. I think if you can, I, I like to be preemptive if I can be. Um, I would definitely, but ha that said, I wouldn't be making like massive musical changes in anyone's mixes once they're, once they're certain happy. Does anyone want to add to that? I, th I think the scariest moment for us is when the downbeat happens of the first song, seeing how it's all going to kind of lay with their vocal. And uh, on this last arena tour, I, I had some success with having a, basically a, an, I called it like an all minus V. So your, your lead singer, you have a, an all, every, every, every brief fader send to a, to a, a, a DCA. And then, so when they come out of the gate, depending on how hard or quiet they're going to sing that night on top of girl screaming and, and arena reverberance and all that stuff you can kind of feather their whole mix without changing their vocal level to them and get it to sit right and then go from there depending on what the room's doing depending on how the crowd's screaming all that kind of stuff and make them as comfortable as you can quickly uh to make your job easier and and make that anxiety of like how is how is this going to go for the, the that that uh crazy five you know, your first song of of scrambling to kind of get things to uh, eight people on stage looking at you if things are wrong you can kind of get that to, to within a couple of millimeters of movement of a couple faders get everybody to be like oh okay okay you know this is this is different from sound check but i can deal with this you know yeah or whatever their reaction might be does anyone want to add to that one before we jump on to the last topic No. So we are getting loads and loads of questions about compression. Where do you use it? Do you use it on vocals? Do you use it on mix buses? Um, and also reverbs. We'll throw that one in there as well. People asking a lot about compression and reverbs. So I think that'll probably take us to the end of the session because that's quite a huge topic. Um, who wants to jump in first with that one? Oh, cool. Is that... Is that Brand Andre? Are you signaling there? Oh, sorry, Alex. Sorry, Alex. There you go. Starting with reverbs, I like to stick reverbs on a lot of things to kind of give different layers of depth to um, different instruments, guitars, keyboards, um, more and less to do individual members. So the guitarists generally, I find they don't want any reverb on it, but if other people just to push it a little bit further back in their mix but without doing eq or volume changes it works quite well um as far as compression goes it's kind of like a does it need it does the dynamic range need to be reduced or b would you be doing it for a tonal thing um on input channels certainly i certainly instruments that the the Musician has the ability to create a large dynamic range. I'd certainly put compression on it. Just, you know, you don't want a singer who sings maybe quietly normally with the mic quite far back suddenly coming in really loud and deafening everybody on stage. Um, I also like to be careful of what I'm sending to my transmitters. 
keeping the, the dynamic range of the really high frequency stuff and the really low frequency stuff in check so that you start you don't start damaging your uh, radio transmission by overloading it in a, a volume sense but with specific frequencies which tend to be the top and tail of the audio spectrum oh yeah great answer he wants to jump on next. I'll jump in if you want. Go on then, chops. Um, yeah, uh, uh, compression is your best friend and your worst enemy, I think, is your answer there. Um, using compression and not knowing uh, what you're doing with it, I think is it, it, you can run the potential of just destroying everything that you've previously created uh, within a mix. I think... Um, you need to, uh, touching on what Alex just said, uh, I think you need to understand, um, as far as in ears go, um, you know, you need to understand what's happening to your mix when it hits the transmitter and, and what happens to that audio signal when it gets to the receiver and then gets uncompanded and gets sent to a set of in-ears. Um, so uh, controlling dynamic range by means of compression into a transmitter, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, and, um, and I always use uh, uh, multiband compression for that. So you can catch, like Alex was just saying, you can catch uh, high-end peaks or low-end peaks, which take a lot of transmission range up, um, and just keep them under check, because otherwise you're gonna end, you can end up with a massive amount of low frequency hitting the transmitter, taking all the power out of it, <clears throat> and you just, you just lose the whole thing. Um, so, I mean, compression for me is about uh, controlling dynamic range. So you've got you've got the end you've got the end result where you've got the, the dynamic range into the transmitter, but then you have to construct a mix. I mean, you could do a whole session on this. Um, the, the the way the way you build a mix and and keep as much natural dynamic range within that mix so that you can hear what's going on um, is down to a judicial use of uh, you know compression and understanding what and what isn't going to leap out. It's not about just you know slamming everything flat so that everything you know if you if you slam everything with a compressor and just squash it to bits you're never going to hear anything that you're doing. So when I'm creating a mix, I'm I'm, I'm trying to uh, keep it as natural sounding as I can. Um, you know, a band wants to have fun when they're playing. It doesn't want to be you know radio one squashed. It needs to be um, it, it it needs to have some sort of naturality about it. And um, and a lot of the a lot of the way you achieve that is by uh, uh, judicious compression on various bits and pieces of the of the mix. I think to add to what the guys say, for me, I use compression on inputs and outputs just to keep the full dynamic range together. And I use the verb for spatial issues to help me create more space in my mix. And with saying that, sometimes a lot of people over compress and change the whole tonality of whatever instrument they compress in per se. And then they start running into another set of issues trying to fix something else that that is now taking the space of where if you release some of that compression, it fix itself. And that's my take on compression. London, now, Brad. I, I think I grab for EQ first. I, I especially, especially going back to what Chopper said earlier of these armatures are traveling down plastic tubes that are millimeters from our ears, and so we're very susceptible to certain frequencies. And and I will coming from being a systems guy and knowing uh, what certain front of house guys will just put air on everything because they're having that, that, that transmission loss from hundreds of feet uh, through the PA and on top of uh, uh, people in the crowd. So that's a habit that some people are into. And then you get, you get on our side of the snake. And to me, I, I high pass and low pass everything to save bandwidth on the transmitter, but also to save fatigue of the ears and really carve out windows of, of what, what, is this competing with and how can I limit that window to not compete, you know, kick drum, bass drum? Is it panning them differently? 
so that the kick drum is just slightly in one ear and the bass drum, I mean, sorry, the bass guitar is slightly in the other and give them unique characteristics of frequency range. And, and it'll, it'll open up your whole mix if you really think, like I think that's something I neglected when I was younger of really looking at that chart of different instruments and seeing what frequency range they, they take up and knowing that 200 to 400 is a really delicate area for most channels to stack up in frequencies and what what frequencies can i get rid of above 10k or even even 8k and above to to uh to get and, and you know in our situation there's there's crowd noise on top of that there's there's a, a natural ambience that's going to add that that air to it anyways so what what can i do to save of uh, ear fatigue and frequencies, both transmission and those armatures, it doesn't take much for them just to excite little tiny transients or fre frequencies. If you can get rid of that on the EQ side, you're not having to um, just layer stuff on top to, to fix the wrong problem. That's a great answer. And finally, Brad, and then we're gonna hand back to Tim. Sure. Uh Everybody kind of touched on a lot of my philosophies. I'll say with regards to compression, I use it a lot for transient shaping. If we have a snare drum that's this big, but it really just needs to be this big in the mix, just to give the time reference, we don't need to be taking up an entire beat with all the sustain that it has. So I use compression for that kind of stuff. On outputs, I use very little, just compression, just to act as glue to kind of put the whole mix together. Um, and then as far as reverb goes, um, with modern country music, we're really going across a lot of genres. We're going from classic country where we have delicate finger pick guitars to rock country with strumming guitars. So I'll use it to kind of, uh, make sure everybody can hear what they're doing at all, all times, whether they're playing gently or playing hard, um, just things like that. I'm pretty very light on compression on vocals. I find a lot of singers just don't like it. Um, if they get loud, they want to get loud. I will put a limiter if on my lead singer, if he tends to scream in between songs, I'll put a limiter on, but most of the time when he's singing, it won't even be near that limiter. Fantastic. Well, that is the end of the session. I'm going to pass back to Tim uh, to close up, but I just want to say thank you so much. When I was a monitor guy, it's quite a lonely experience. You never, because it's just you listening in and the band. So it's quite difficult to kind of get other people's take on things. Um, so thank you guys. I know this has been incredible for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, over, over to Tim. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to say to everyone watching up, that's not a panelist that's watching this. Uh, thank you for all the questions. I really wish we could have uh, hit every one of them now. We're going to try to export this list of questions and look for some commonality. And uh, um, I'll hit the panelist here. Maybe we hit you guys with an email with some of these questions and we can build yeah. a response after the fact. It's uh, really a lot of great questions. 90 minutes is a, uh, it's a, it's a long time, but it's tough to get 154 questions in. So for those of you we didn't get to, we'll try to figure something out to get back to you there. Um, I, I want to say thanks to everyone here, Chopper and Alex and Landon and Andre and Brad. Thanks for joining us. Andy, thanks for being the co-host on this. David, who's got the Sound Academy logo in the background. Thanks for all the background help. It's been great. Uh, we're going to have one of these every Tuesday for the next few weeks at least, uh, maybe a little bit more depending on things. But again, thanks for joining us at the Don't Stop the Education series here by Sennheiser Sound Academy, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.